Welcome to another episode of Roasting Marshmallows. My name is Rolf Suit and I'm your host. So as a software engineer, I like to try new things, new frameworks, new approaches, new techniques, and even new versions of the tools that I'm currently using. But will these things actually make me more productive or will it make my team more productive? Uh, will it make for a better product? And uh, how much effort should we put in keeping up to date with the latest trends in software engineering? To help us figure this out today, we have uh, Alpar Gal around the campfire. Alpar uh, is a passionate software developer. He started his journey as a C++ developer 15 years ago. I also started 15 years ago, so that's cool. Uh, a couple of, couple of years later, he switched to Java and web application development. He is coding for fun in his free time when he's not busy at home with the kids. He's interested in software development topics in general and uh, iOS development. So uh, welcome, Alpar. Yeah, thank you. Having so here. I heard you had three kids, so how do you have free time for software development? Uh, I want to know. I have three kids as well, so I really want to know how you do it. <laughs> Well, actually, if you cannot sleep, you can do it overnight, uh, of course. <laughs> Nowadays, um, yeah, I'm also exhausted, so uh, that means uh, I have no free time yeah. anymore. So, Cool. All right, and yeah, you already heard him a bit. Uh, Arno was back in the building as well. How are you doing? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah well, I, I really did wonder about the three kids and actually having some free time. So I guess, I don't yeah, know maybe how old can, your third uh, uh, kid is, but uh, it's not going to happen anymore, just saying. <laughs> Yeah, it's over. Maybe you, get, you guys can share some tips, maybe, and see uh, yeah. see where it goes. Someone who doesn't have three kids is Enhik. He's also in the podcast today, but you uh, you have one, right? So you still your free time is also limited, I I would imagine. Yeah, I have one, but uh, I I remember in the past I used to actually do uh, like a uh, coding on my free time as a hobby, and it changed. So I'm actually wondering now why did it yeah. change? Why don't I do it more often? So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're talking a bit about, uh, like, always trying to apply the newest technologies. Like, is it needed? Uh, I can maybe start with, with my experience of it in the past because my, um, my very first employer, we were kind of vendor locked in a very old Java runtime environment, Java 3. And we really wanted to go up to Java 5, but we could not because we had a dependency in there that uh, would just not work under newer versions of the uh, virtual machine. Uh, and for us, it was actually um, yeah, costing us a lot of time because we had to keep supporting this old stuff and build build front ends with it all with this old uh, stuff. And uh, yeah, we had to migrate to something new. Uh, but uh, it it yeah, it proved really really hard for us. Um, but yeah, that's at least a, an example that I can give where we wanted to move to something new, but we just had to put so much effort into it that it was almost impossible to do. But so why how did would you, you want guys... to move to something new? Why did you want uh, to move to something new? Because the the, the front end technology that we that we had back then, <clears throat> they um, the product wasn't maintained anymore. So uh, basically, okay. basically we could not, uh, yeah, we could not use it in production. Like all the licenses were expiring, there was no support uh, left anymore. Uh, but yeah, it was this huge CRUD application where we yeah we had to replace all the screens one by yeah. one, and uh, yeah, it was 15 years in development as well uh, by that point in time. And I guess you guys also know that uh, replacing stuff, uh, yeah, that's 15 years in the making is going to take a while. But that was like an, a, an example where we actually had to migrate to something new where we just where we just couldn't. Uh, but I think it would make it would have made us more productive if we actually, you know, took the bullet and actually and actually did it. Um, but I don't know if you guys have uh, have some examples of where you actually, uh, yeah, wanted to migrate to something new where it wasn't actually even needed. Oh, several times. <laughs> I did that myself. <laughs> I think the the basic example that I can think of with my, at least my career, is like a small, let's say, a frameworks upgrade that doesn't per se break your code or doesn't require a lot. Just has like this nice new feature that you think you're going to need it and you just go for it. So I think I did quite a bit of those, but I don't think they per se helped me in the sense of like using those functionalities. But I think it did help me to keep up to date and not having this problem you had that in 15 years time you have this huge uh, yeah. problem in your hands that is a migrating and legacy application with new technology that you are too outdated to actually keep up. Yeah. So you did it incrementally? Yeah, with the different reasons. My reason was very selfish just to try a new feature and yeah, okay. automatically solve a different problem. But let's say you do it incrementally, but that doesn't really solve the old screens that Rolf is mentioning. 
Yeah. So how do you see that? I, I don't follow the question. Well, let's say you have an old dependency. Apparently, it's no longer licensed, <coughs> but every screen you have is dependent on it. The incremental updates won't solve that. Yeah, I so don't know. Like, you, I think I think Alper had that uh, lively uh, experience before us. Oh. Yeah, we try with, um, well, in my experience, actually, well, and mostly, well, we actually migrated a lot, uh, mostly uh, Spring frameworks, for example. Mm -hmm. That actually came with some nice uh, goodies, you know, that you have some new features, you have annotations, uh, some Spring security brings a lot of, uh, you know, Spring default things, but, uh, yeah. of course, uh, um, that takes a lot of effort as well to migrate, and we've been, uh, I think we were Spring Three at some point there was a lot of gap that we waited there, and yeah. then went to spring four. But then no, even in spring five was out, and and there were a lot of troubles going on five directly. So we actually went to four first, um, but then you know since then they actually even stopped. So um, yeah, we we yeah. bring bring some new stuff. It came, but um, overall, yeah, I would say the shape of the project still uh, didn't change like uh, in sense of like. Um, um, like a big, big change. It, it wasn't that. And of course, with JavaScript frameworks, I had some experience in the past, not mm -hmm. even my current company, but even back then, uh, there was a framework called I think, XGS, for example, that's um, a JavaScript framework. And the company was at 1.0 and then came the 2.0 out and there were like weeks of migration. And then uh, the, the third one came out as well. And then of course, the designer actually pushed us to, to migrate because uh, the designer was able to Makes nicer screens and nicer designs, yeah. okay. and then the whole jumps to the up to the up actually took us like uh, even months sometimes uh, to 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 migrate. And was it worth and, it? Um, from coding point of view, not I would say for so for this specific your, reason. Is the for designer a designer, happy? Or? Well, a designer was, but then I, after a couple of years, I just heard they actually went into a tougher different uh, bootstrap framework, <laughs> so tougher a different direction. So, yeah, because yeah. I was going to say, right, that uh, in JavaScript land, like new versions and new libraries, they, it's, I mean, it's going so fast, it's insane. It's impossible yeah, to keep it up there, I think. <clears throat> so so how, how do you think you could do differently then? Because this was apparently migration for the designer. But, and it's, was it, well, not really worth it what I get from your story because they went a different direction? Could you have handled it differently or your team? Mm, I'm not sure if we could handle because I think that the, the, what I see the trend is that when you know, of course, when you're working on a project yourself, right, you're fine with the technologies. Of course, you want to choose the different tools, but then when, when, for example, new joiners comes, right, and then or for freshmen coming from university out, they already on on the next step already. So like nowadays, they are talking React and uh, Angular and all these uh, fancy things. So. Uh, and of course, I see also in our project, we are still using XGS for, for, for our own uh, development. And I see nobody heard about it. Uh, yeah. And, and how, of course, how everybody does the, is... Uh, how yeah. does the discussion go then? Like, okay, the designer says like, oh man, <clears throat> I would really like to have this so I can make, uh, I don't know, a cool new page. But uh, isn't there anyone in product that says, well, it's cool that you might be able to make these kinds of pages, but our product does not need this kind of stuff. Like, are you guys having these kinds of conversations with, with, with each other? Well, back then we we of course everybody likes a new version of library, right? Of course, it's not yeah. something like you know, you just give me a the Spring Boot three point oh instead of uh, one point oh, and then yeah, I would definitely want to go there, right? Uh, yeah. As new yeah, features yeah. and new cool stuff. Yeah. Um, nowadays, what, what I see that actually we are um, we are actually talking a lot what we where we want to go, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly, what of course is JavaScript, right? But I'm not my my own, uh, you know, the nicest area. So actually, me myself, I like more, you know, doing some uh, backend or not CSS development. So <laughs> for me, I like uh, you know XGS framework as it is. It's a pretty cool one. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, actually, we, we we I think back then, of course, I was a junior back then, or like quite some time ago. Yep. I think we could have pushed it back, uh, saying that it doesn't work. But yeah. I see also the other point, if you stay too much, you will have a huge gap. And I think you will end up like uh, um, as you, that you actually stayed at Java 3. And 
Yeah. yeah. I guess who wants to work on Java Tree, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah man, it's insane. And uh, I mean, they had a lot of other really old technology as well. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen some bad legacy, but I think that one was actually the worst, like my first my first job. But wow. yeah, yeah that's, uh, this is how it goes, right? And uh, but like I wonder Arno, right? Because we're like okay, we yeah. three like Rolf and Alper and I, we come from a Java background, but uh, Arno comes from the legacy background called PHP. In my eyes, like did you see any? Uh, how was your experience towards that? Or you guys don't have libraries? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <clears throat> so I th well, yes, there are libraries to start with, but I think 15 years ago, it wasn't that big yet in this world. I think more like, uh, there were a few, but they were pretty mediocre. So what most of them did was build something on their own, which we all know is pretty bad idea. Huh. So the migration to something else, yeah, that was always an issue, like always. There was no exception to that rule. So that's my, uh, my uh, experience on that. So the, the remembering to develop something for three months because you were stuck in something. Yeah, that happens. So I think we had to get smart a little bit on how to actually migrate one part of the system to something new and then leave the old ones there and hope for the best that it still works. And uh, because I remember we did a project <coughs> together in the beginning of uh, when we both joined Four Scouts and uh, it was like a PHP project. and. They had like two frameworks. Like we, you try to migrate the team to a new framework because you said, "Well, this framework yeah. sucks, so we should go down this path." And then I remember you managed to do some hack that you kept both framework working on the same time. Do yeah. you still think that's a good choice, good idea, good path to go to? Yeah, because in the end, the features we all like, right? The stuff, the new stuff it brings. There are some benefits there. And I think in the case of the customer, I know which customer you're talking about, I think it worked. Okay. Because for so example, like that whole library concept you're talking about, the framework I brought in actually brings that as well, like a proper integration of that. Yeah. Because like uh, in, in your guys' eyes, <coughs> like which, uh, which are the arguments that you should actually move to a new library? What do you guys actually consider? Because I remember having a talk with Alper as well, and he said, like, yeah, you know, you get these new developers, and they come, and, oh, there is this yeah. new thing, we need to move this, you know, and in the end, at zero value. So, like, what do you guys, as senior developers, consider to be, oh, yeah, now I'm going to consider to move the for whole code a, base? For me, it's a few things. One of them is security. I think that's often an issue when you have something really old. Some stuff is just end of life, and I think that's a reason to move. And the other part is getting to onboard new people. I think that's also a danger and a risk for your company. Because let's say you have a s system of 15 years old and you're running something from 50 years old, then yeah, who wants to join your company, right? I think that's a, that's a hard to, not to crack. So there's some risk there. Yeah. Yeah, for me, uh, I mean, I agree with what, what uh, Arna was saying, but I also think that um, it's important to have, you know, readable code because <clears throat> any any server can run whatever crap you write. Um, but the point is that, you know, once the code gets opened by indeed like a new guy or someone who hasn't worked on a project and they need to be able to understand what is happening. And um, so that, that, that actually goes both ways, right? Because if you use like the newest for example, Java with the Java streams, like maybe not everyone has actually used that before. Uh, so they might get really confused when they see super new stuff like that, but you can also have it the other way around where, you know, you're using a super crusty old code base, like a lot of uh, iterative stuff. And then, you know, it's just really hard to maintain, maybe hard to test. So uh, yeah, that, to me, that would be at least a, a good reason to, to go to something new where the readability improves, the testability improves and uh, yeah, the security. So Alpar, what about you? What would be a reason to go to a new version of a technology stack or a library or whatever? Or a totally different one? Depends, I think. Uh, well, totally well, I think I have in my mind I have two, two, um, two um, options. And I, of course, one, if, if you decide to go all the time with, with, you know, with, with the new versions all the time, if you, of course, if you can manage that, 
uh, depends on, of course, in, on your, your size of the projects as well, right? If you decide mm -hmm. to actually migrate all the time, so if you know a new spring comes out, you go there all the time, all right away. Uh, of a new, I don't know, something got, comes out and you switch. If your project, of course, is, uh, you know, um, 10 years old, even more, they have a lot of code. And of course, it's, perhaps it's not really well written as well. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, you have a lot of dependencies and you, you have a lot of couplings. Mm. Then, of course, everybody would, I, uh, I would say, the, the product owner and the, everyone was kind of, you know, is a bit of pushy back that, you know, you have something, but you don't want to go there yet. Mm. Um, but as for new features, I, me personally, what I saw, for example, when, when we actually jumped from, uh, I think, Java 1.5 to like uh, 1.8, it was already like a big uh, relief and it was not that hard. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, for example, now Java is coming out every six months or something like that. Um, and yeah, the features, what is coming, that's not that big uh, 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 at all as well. But do you upgrade so, or do you leave it right now? Uh, we talk to upgrade, but it's not that... I think we, we didn't do, do the choice that actually go right away on that. So we are... I think we took the path of like a, like a mix of that. So we actually go on the next major one, which will be supported long term. For example, I think the one port, the, the 16, I think, it will come out. It's already out. Um, no, it's already out. So you guys are late. But, yeah. <laughs> but he I, means I, the next I, one, right? So it's, it's <laughs> I think my approach to to migrate, if we get enough features that uh, would make sense, then I actually would would go there to upgrade. But does doesn't this make it really hard? Because then you have to step like five versions or for something, then you think it's valuable, but it also keeps you back a lot right now. I think it skips a back. Um, but I did not think it through. Um, uh, it depends because if we talk about purely Java, that's you know that's um, uh, static types, right? Uh, you, you know, not compiles yeah. and frameworks. If you think about JavaScript, yeah, that's yeah. a totally different story there. Yeah, um, I think so too. Yeah, because I think, for example, like what struck me in the past as well is like a. Uh, at least I have a new preference, like for example, for Kotlin over Java, and a few people move that down direction as well. And I think that's like a, a, somehow a bigger change that I notice on the, at least on the Java community, a lot of people are afraid of doing that change. But once they try, they say like, "Oh, I haven't I done this before, right?" But like I try to remember my motivations, and my motivations was mainly like, "Yeah, what Rolf said, like the code is gonna get cleaner." I can do more with less words, let's say more v verbal, and my tasks got better. I think this is should be, I guess, those are my motivations to upgrade a language, but I guess we also have to make a distinction between languages, features, and libraries, and frameworks. But the other point that I'm trying to bring it is the how do you mitigate this issue, right? Like, do you guys apply some designs, architecture style to now after you became like a senior developer to avoid this problem in the future? Yeah, so who, who is uh, who yeah, I'll buy Europe. that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, of course, you have the, all your nice, um, your nice practices and, uh, and, and patterns, but actually to apply, I mean, of course you could buy, and, and, but uh, you know, you all, all the time have trade-offs, uh, right? So I... Um, and if you check, of course, the internet is full of, um, you know, uh, practices and full of uh, designs as well. Um, but this, this is on the, this is on the book, I would say. Uh, so when, mm -hmm. when you are there to, you know, to, to start writing the code and you start writing the tests, you, you all the time, uh, you have to make choices, right? Yeah. And of course, if you say you are making by the book as the book is ri writing it, you know, you will end up... Um, Almost like a hugely, you know, loose coupled code with uh, really scattered uh, classes, for example. And um, so you say that's not per se ideal to do by the book. It's not, I would say. But I mean, it's nice that you read the book and you know the practices and you start applying them. But at the end, you always needs to make choices and you always needs to take a decision which one to apply. 
and in yeah, so the like, framework can you name for, for can you name a few practices that you you're talking about or you have in mind uh, like you mean like for example encapsulament and uh like uh, decoupling uh, are those the practices that uh, you are describing yeah for example by decoupling but in case you you have for example you want to solve a problem and you, let's say you are decoupling that software into small classes right say you end up having a you know bunch of classes which are really decoupled yeah but they're really uh, um let's say uh scattered in the system let's mm -hmm. say yeah and then of course if you start thinking now now they say what is keeping me busy you know writing um unit test to be uh not fragile for example mm -hmm. i think nowadays this actually keeps me really uh thinking when I used to, you know, practice, for example, TDD, uh, that that how much you want to break your, your tests in your classes, like what's the uh, amount of unit tests needs to talk with the class, for example. Yeah. Uh, in the past, they were, they were practices like, you know, one class should have one unit test uh, in the sense of like a, um, as a concept. Mm -hmm. Do you think the size of the code base also influences these kinds of design choices? Like, let's say you have a microservice with one endpoint and maybe, you know, one responsibility. So the amount of business logic in there is limited as well. Do you still go by the book or do you say like, no, nah, I'm just going to make the simplest thing that I can make to just reduce the cognitive load for myself? I used to just apply the thing what actually works and what actually feels uh, right uh, at right. the beginning. Yeah. And if if I don't see that it makes sense to decouple that much, I actually don't do it. Uh, yeah, but like now, but then you're talking about like if I feel it, so that means it comes from a place of experience, right? So at some yes. point you had to make the wrong choice or the right choice to, to figure out that this feeling makes sense more for you. But it's more like, because like, for me, I, I can I think I can understand what you're saying, but it's the same. Like I remember watching this uh, small uh, video with Uncle Bob talking about, like, for example, like basic concept like test coverage, right? Uh, any number that is not a hundred percent does not make sense. And I think he says around this line, like if you're trying to write tests to not cover a hundred percent of your code, it makes no sense saying like, okay, I get eighty percent of my my code is is uh, covered. So you're basically telling implicitly that 20% you have no idea what it does. And then, but we also know that 100% is also not per se good, right? Because if you just go for the number, you can write tests that touch every line of code, but test nothing. So how do you guys see that? Because it's, I think 100% is the only number that it makes sense, but at the same time is a number that is impossible to reach or should not be reached. <clears throat> Yeah, and it's it's also like you can configure your tools right to you know disregard certain clauses as well, so you can artificially get it up to a hundred percent. So yeah. I don't know. Um, it's it's uh, it's a bit hard. I think it just depends on uh, how many incidents you are having, right? I mean, let's say you have eighty-five percent code coverage without any you know trickery or any exclusion rules or whatever, and you never have an incident in production because your code is robust and, and like your business logic is well tested. Uh, then. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree that 100% is the only one that counts. Yeah, but then you you have 15% that you do not know what it does. Okay, but are you going to write unit tests for your configuration? Do you think Why that's not? valuable then? Why not? But what's the but what's the what's the desired outcome then? Is the desired outcome green dashboards or is it working like a, a product that's actually live and making customers happy. Well, you could get both without having zero percent tests, right? <laughs> we have seen software that make actually make money and have zero lines of unit tests. Yeah, but then I don't sleep at night. I don't know if that's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah, but that's my point. Then how? Wh what makes you have the confidence that eighty-five percent is good enough? Like this feeling that I hope is saying, like, wow, I go based on my feeling. So you have a feeling that 85% is uh, acceptable for you to go to sleep and feel that you tested your code. So like, well, how does this come to be? Like, why this magic number of 85, 80%? So for me, uh, 
if I wrote it myself, then I will be confident. But the whole point is if you're in a team of people, then not I'm not arrogant not at so, all, this guy. <laughs> then I'm not so confident. We work together, Rolf, so I know your sense now. It's, uh, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see the trust you have in your team. No, but yes. you can only trust yourself, right? Better. You can only trust <laughs> sometimes you can't even trust yourself, man. Like, I can't sometimes even remember what I did three days ago. So, But I know, like, 100% just seems so. Like, Stress. let's say you have, like, like, for example, we were talking about spring, right, a lot. And then I have my configuration classes where I just list my beans. Yeah. And then if you don't have a specific unit test for, yeah. for that stupid configuration class, then boom, your test coverage goes from 100 to 98%. But Perhaps, still, yeah. these, this configuration code is not actual business logic, right? Like, nothing is happening there. It is just configuring the application so if okay so so actually starts then, then i'm gonna I'm be in the code yeah so like because i know we work together as well right and yeah. we had bugs that because of configuration and if we had a test on those that bug would not be there right and like we have basic things like i don't know urls that are in a configuration that is malformed or it's supposed to be a number and then came as a string or it was a boolean because of yamo or json like we have this constantly, right? The question is, why don't we write a test for that? Because we somehow judge it to be Safe. not business logic I or not important. About how often it changes. In our feeling or our mindset, configuration doesn't change that often. And your code is more alive. But that's the whole point of configuration, right? It changes quite often. That's why you make a configuration. I don't know. So like people can go and change it without having to go through the source code and the whole flow. Okay, you guys get my point, right? So yeah, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to bring the conversation towards is the idea that like, okay, we talk about libraries, we talk about upgrades, and I have the feeling that at least the new developers, the junior ones that I, I uh, work with, they are more focused on that than actually trying to get their craft right, right? And then I, that's the discussion I want to ask you guys. Do you see software as a craft, as like a gift that you have to be really good at it? Or do you just see like... A, as we heard from the last podcast with news, the developers are the new miners. Everybody can do it. It's a boring job. Like, what is your view on it? Yeah, I'll par. Let's, let's hear I it, would man. say they are mostly like a crafters. But of course, I think there's, it's not a versus because I think the title is that uh, software crafters versus new tech. But I think the craftsmans are bringing the new tech uh, right uh, up. Uh, I mean, they are releasing or they are you know, annoyed or something, and they actually writing a new one, right? Uh, or new things. So, um, so I think it's not a versus, but it's like a, I think a software enforcement actually bring, brings the new tech uh, further. I would say. But you consider so, yourself more like a, an artist or more like a worker, factory worker. <laughs> well, hopefully, I'm an artist. Uh, <laughs> But I see, I mean, I mean, in my mind, uh, new tech is nice and, and you could use it and that would help you. But uh, in my mind, I think you could make uh, a mess with a new tech uh, as well. So for me, um, craftsmanship is more important than new tech. You could make, I think, pretty nice um, software in C++ even, right? Or, or any other old PHP, technology. apparently. Yeah, I think so as well. I can write beautiful things, man. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, maybe if you just compare now, uh, you know, uh, the newest uh, shiny frameworks that perhaps that's, uh, those are nicer. But I, I, at some point, I just think that Softman Crossmans are getting bored, so they are making a new thing for themselves, and then, you know, they just release outside, right? I mean, I can think of that one as well, right? Do you yeah, do you okay. think that it's also uh, in part like the fault of the the companies because like if uh, if companies are hiring like sure J unit might be on the list of like required skills for a developer but you know most of the companies see like oh we need we need this guy that's really good with angular or we need a guy that's really good with oracle or 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 whatever so so do you think that a lot of developers want to learn like these technologies these 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 things just for resume building or is it purely a personal interest in becoming the best possible developer they can be? Both. Yeah, I would say mostly software and craftsmen, they just learn uh, because they, they love what they do, right? I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I mean, for us in the hiring process, was, I mean, of course, was night bonus for this and that. 
but there was never never ever a, a requirement and even a, like a, something like we didn't wanted him because he didn't know a spring for example yeah, yeah. for us was never never the case uh, we just think that of course software frameworks they just you know they come and go uh, in my mind yeah and i think what's important is you know how you can use it and how you want to use it and you know what kind of things you do with it uh, what's your practices and what's your uh, and how you are writing your code and what you think when you write your code i think this in my mind it is the most important ones uh, so so Opar, like when you for example build a new a new project like you have an, like an idea for a new a new uh, new product do you jump to the latest and greatest like okay it's going to be you know java 16 or 17 or i don't even know what version they have nowadays and uh, you know spring 5 and i'm going to use an alpha version of this and that like do you pick the shiniest new stuff or do you say like no man i, I need to validate my idea as quick as possible so i'm going to go with the tried and true production proven hardened stuff mm, i think we still just get the, the new study stuff because I'm, I'm mostly um uh you know want to learn new things as well so mm. that means uh that's the opportunity uh, you have you try to try the latest one or something even of course i would not choose something like totally different from from my uh, area so that means if mm -hmm. i'm java stack then i keep still saying you know stay in my um in the radar radar but so in that sense, that? sorry. Why would you stay in your comfort zone in that part? Well, I mean, the comfort zone, like the language itself. Yeah, um, yeah, like in the even the Java skill, because I could imagine it. If let's say you have an idea, and there's just some other languages that's way better at it, would you go for it, or would you then still go for the same thing you know? Because uh, well, you mentioned like Java 18 or 17. I don't even know. Has the shiny things? You say well, I would go for that, but it's still in your space, right? Maybe there's something else somewhere else which is way more shiny, but it's not Java. Ooh. It's uh, I don't know, Kotlin, Microsoft, Kotlin. Oh. <laughs> That's a big difference, yeah. <laughs> Let's go with Rust. Uh, Man. If you would just think about work, then perhaps I would stay in Java because I think kind of in work we are kind of more like in Java, uh, everyone. Yep. If it's uh, of course in my home, you know, uh, in my own thing, and of course I would just simply try whatever it. Uh, it comes and what about it I'm interested on. Yeah. And why do you think for the work it's different? Well, I think it's for consistency reason, perhaps. Uh, or perhaps our... More uh, expectation, I guess, right? Like your work already know that you are a Java developer and they kind of probably are on the same line. And now that your team as well, right? You're not alone. Yeah, colleagues, so I can imagine yeah. that uh, it's not per se a solo choice. Okay, and but, I keep hearing, but, for example, also from my colleagues uh, who actually now, for example, try out Kotlin, for example. Yeah. I think nowadays, so Kotlin gets a bit of hype also in our team, yeah. you know, saying, ah, well, in Kotlin, you could do that one uh, so fast and so nice. But, okay. hmm. And then what is your first reaction? Like, I don't want to hear this or is like, oh, I want to try. Um, my first reaction was, I could, of course, I think I'm, I'm, I was working a lot with Java. So perhaps my first reaction is, yeah, well, nice. Uh, perhaps uh, sometimes I will try out, but not, not per se. I'm, I'm that interested on to, to, yeah. to, to, you know, jump right away on it. Uh, I think so it also depends on my own interests as well. I think in my own, you know, in my home, uh, when I'm used to code, I used to code in Swift and iOS. Mm. Uh, so mostly that's my interest, uh, kind of from these days. Uh, so that's I something that I don't PhD, get. Eh? So, <laughs> uh, go ahead. I know. So that's something I don't get. So on, let's say you you have a vacature out there. If some somebody wants to apply to a job, and then we say, okay, the framework doesn't matter. That's something we don't look at because the guy has to be good or whatever. Yeah. Do you think the language matters then? Because for me, it's a bit the same thing. Mm. Um, a language matters a bit, but not, I mean, I would say it matters a bit because if you are, for example, a C-sharp developer, um, yeah, it depends on what kind of level we are looking for, for example. Yeah, the seniority level definitely uh, makes a difference, for, yes. for at least yes. in my eyes. If you like don't a, know the language, uh, sometimes you, you are kind of uh, hold back because of the language. So... Yeah. I, for example, it, it doesn't matter either. If of course you could have, be a .NET developer, you could do write Java code, but you would still need uh, some time until you are 
you can express yourself easily. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with uh, in that point is like if you are uh, like just starting, well, we use the word junior for that. Uh, I think the language, it makes it really hard because you did not even master or get close to understand one language yet. And then you get to see a second one and then you cannot draw like a patterns between the two but once you become more senior and more senior i think it becomes quite irrelevant of course i think java i'm always going to be quicker than uh, any other language and uh, because that's what i did for really long but when i look at another language now it's just about taste right like oh php is ugly oh this is pretty oh this is i like more oh i miss this one from that library but it's in the end it's about the same concepts afterwards for, for a junior it doesn't matter where he starts doesn't it when it starts, junior, I think it like, doesn't matter. But if exactly, you have to change so, in between, it's tough. Like you did one year of Java, then you do one year of PHP, then you do one year of C Sharp, then in the end it's like you don't know any of the languages well enough to become, I so think. Do you need the whole in-depth thing? Uh, well, that, that, that kind of depends on the job opening, right? <clears throat> yeah. If, 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 if they're okay with him learning it and stuff, then sure, the language itself doesn't matter either. But, but you're uh, junior, so I think you're also always there to learn yeah but like let's say you hire a junior java developer and you have like a you know well-defined backlog and you can give him uh, you know pair him up with uh, one of the other developers like he can be instantly productive rather than okay first i need to learn the syntax here and uh, you know how do i run these programs even and all this kind of stuff and uh, yeah i feel as, uh, if you're a bit more senior then you can just apply the patterns that you've learned in Java. And then the only thing you need to learn is like, okay, what's the syntax of this, you know, Python script or Ruby script or whatever. So yeah, but it's also just, like, uh, yeah. like I remember when I moved a little bit away from Java to JavaScript, I started basically trying to write Java code in JavaScript, right? Like you do getters and setters and everything, like the same thing as you do in Java. And then you somehow thinking JavaScript is the same, but it is a bit different. So people who actually doesn't have script would look at me like, why are you doing this? This is a bit, a bit off. Or I don't understand why all these uh, verbose things. And I think, of course, there is one language can learn from the other, but it's, uh, I don't know. I also caught a lot of uh, guys also come from the same from PHP to Java that they don't understand the concepts of threads or they don't understand the concept mm -hmm. of, uh, like I, I knew, for example, that PHP did not have a map and I explained them, hey guys, you do a map or a set. And they're like, what a set is, you know? And I'm like, okay, that's uh, weird. So I can but imagine they end, don't, they lose. Yeah, but you yeah. can learn, right? Those are no. details in a language, I would say. Of course you can learn. But what would your criteria of hiring someone be then? I know you just hire anyone I don't know. to learn. Well, I think there should be some development experience. I think that's the... It depends on what you're looking for. I was just questioning if the language okay. itself was actually that important. No, but like, uh, so if you hire anyone, so like people who are also developing in Excel would be a candidate for you. Um, they might be better than me, man. <laughs> Did you see the possibilities in Excel? It's like, wow. Yeah. So, so I want to, I want to, I want to turn it around a little bit back to, you know, yeah. shiny new things and stuff like that, because, uh, I was, you know, I was thinking about like my own experiences and stuff and like, um, you know, moving to something new, which actually made me more productive. And I did actually come up with an example uh, because I used to program in Eclipse, right? All the, all the, all the time. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought it was, a, I thought it was a great editor. You know, I even wrote some plugins for it and stuff like that. And I thought like, yeah, man, this is some, uh, some cool stuff. And then I was looking at IntelliJ, you know, it's like, yeah, what a man expensive, you know, what, a, yeah. what the hell. Uh, but then I actually got a license for it and actually started using it. And it was, damn, you know, this is a huge difference. And it actually made me more productive. So do you guys uh, also feel, uh, you know, have similar experiences like that where moving to a different tool or a different library did actually boost, like, either the quality of the product or the quality of your work? Yes. IntelliJ definitely is one of them. And I have exactly yes. the same case. I love the clips and for me it was like, wow, no other ID is ever going to take me out. And IntelliJ did. And the second one is the one that I also based on IntelliJ. And a lot of developers, they blame me for it, but I refuse to use Git in a command line. There is a group of people making a nice UI to make it very handy for you. And then developers basically do that for a living, but they refuse it to use. But when I, I changed using Git on a UI, my life became so much better. So yes, this tool for sure is my, my top list. 
All right, Alpar, what about you? No, I think IntelliJ uh, actually is it. It was a game changer. I was um, yeah, I'm back in my university uh, time. I was doing using Eclipse, mm-hmm. and of course when I switched to Java, then we used uh, IntelliJ from the version one actually or the first versions. Then when I joined to Netherlands, actually you know, my company was using Eclipse, and yeah, I had a bit of um, resistance, and even even somehow I just paid for my own pocket there for the license. Okay. And I think in two years, everybody switched uh, to IntelliJ in that company one by one, even the, paying themselves from, from, from their pocket. And because I saw my colleagues, you know, they actually spent a lot of time troubleshooting why this server doesn't start. Yeah. And it was because of uh, the plugin of yeah. uh, the web server, you know, screwed up. Yeah. So I they were know, spending... Uh, yeah. I don't even know, like, Eclipse, like, what version... Like, does it still actually is under active maintenance? Like, I've, I haven't used it yeah. in, like, six years or something. It is. Okay. Um, it's it's yeah. a lot of other softwares are basing on them. But, for example, even Google, um, Google, the Android... Tool Not bit, anymore. It's on IntelliJ it's actually, as well. Yeah, it went to IntelliJ as well. It was yeah. time when they actually switched. So, <clears throat> talking about new shiny things, how do you view this perspective on the whole cloud movement? Needed. Yeah, I think nowadays that's the hype, and I see a lot of companies are even on them on, on on the cloud, or they are going to public clouds. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, stuff, and I think you could just you know borrow a lot of compute, right? You just you, know, you have to pay, and then you can scale up in 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 uh, in, in one go. Mm. And yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a bit. Um, yeah, how do you say? Because you can make, like with the cloud, you, you have a lot of possibilities, but you can also make a lot of crap as well, right? Like, uh, I think we've had this example where we saw this, this, this company just made, you know, 150 different lambdas, you know, writing to weird databases, connecting it with other code as well. Like, yeah, it's just impossible to debug. So, um, yeah, that, that aspect, but I guess you can make, uh, yeah, you can make crappy code, so I guess you can also make crappy cloud infrastructures. Uh, I do worry a bit of, um, you know, sometimes when you hear about these um, uh, power outages or like any, you know, uh, uh, incident that Amazon has and like all the big websites, all of a sudden like boom, they go out. So sometimes it feels like as uh, as IT, we put all of our eggs into uh, into one basket. But uh, I definitely think it's I think it's awesome that you don't have to actually maintain like the hardware and stuff anymore and go to a data center and oh my god the hard disk is full like yeah I, I do think that um, yeah making making the hardware like the, the infrastructure a bit more you know code centric and yeah um, how do you say more fluent definitely helps you know scaling up or even quickly deploying stuff. Yeah, you know, because yeah, I can just spin up a new instance and then boom, it's running somewhere, and uh, you can start using it. So, I think it accelerates companies. Yeah, I agree, and I think like what you're describing as well, in the sense of like putting all the eggs in one basket. I don't see how that is unique because before you had your own data center, it was worse because you had to maintain it yourself, right? So it's like uh, now at least you hope that is in the hands of uh, more experienced yeah, but I mean, people. Yeah, but I mean, then just one company is, is, is down. And now if Amazon has a problem, like, okay, I can't access GitHub. Yeah. I cannot go to the Rabobank. I cannot, uh, I'm just saying random yep. stuff here, right? Yeah, but yeah. then like like half of my internet just goes down. So then yeah. sometimes it kind of feels like, you know, everything is, is based on like one or two uh, things. And then once they fall over, then everything goes, goes to yeah. crap. But do you think it brings to more, uh, well, do you think it brings complexity to the team to actually move to cloud? Or do you think it's easier? To move or to be on the cloud? Well, well I people think for, know. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. What we experienced, uh, we actually moved to cloud. Um, in our project, it was like, a, I think it was day and night. So for us, uh, having on under your hand all the infrastructure, that's that's actually the biggest benefit I would say. We, we actually we can manage everything in that sense. In the past, when when there was something trouble, like the disk is full, yeah, you could do you couldn't do anything. Uh, you could just simply tell, well, the software doesn't work because the disk is full. <laughs> so you you then open the ticket for somebody else uh, department, and you know that eventually got uh, increased or 
you know, you could, in a good case, you could delete something if you have access to the yeah. server. And nowadays, um, yeah, if the disk is full, of course, you get alert because now it's pretty modern. Um, you could yeah. find alerts uh, out mm -hmm. of box and you could uh, get notifications before happening. But on the other hand, yeah, you could just simply manage yourself, uh, the whole thing. Uh, and I think that's kind of, I see in the cloud, that's the biggest benefit our team uh, has. So I mean, you wouldn't go of back? Course, no, I would say so. I mean, comparing what, of course, we had on the on real metal servers or, you know, somewhere in, uh, in the data centers, comparing that with not currently what we have, like, uh, you know, infra as a code, I wouldn't, wouldn't go so, back at all, I would say. So if we, if we, if we turn it around, uh, let's say, you know, you move to a new version of something and it actually made the product or your experience worse. Did you guys ever experience something like that in the past? Where upgrading to the new shiny stuff actually made your life miserable? And not just because of the time invested, but like, let's say, you know, the migration is done and then, oh my God, this kind of sucks. Well, I do have an interesting discussion though, like, because we did do this while helping, for example, like uh, teams move into what we judge to be nicer or better for their user case. And that case mm -hmm. was like a uh, event source and CQRS. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually a lot of them go back to the old CRUD model with a uh, three layer architecture. Yep. So in that point of view, I think it was worse, bad, but it, somehow I noticed that a lot of developers, they are not getting it anymore. Like they wanted to get the crude thing done and they, they stop there. They don't want to go deeper into different ways and probably more effective and understand the trade-off. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, I did, but not per se in the sense of technology, but more like in architectural style. People had a hard yeah. time grasping it. Yeah. And that's not per se a fault of the architecture, but more it's just a level up in complexity and that might be too much for a team. I don't or even know if it's the level it in account. Should you just take the people in account? Like those guys won't get it. So we should adjust the architecture based on it. How can I judge if they will get it or not? Right. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's also true. Yeah. But then I how, guess... how hard do you push it then? Yeah. So I guess that's the question I have for you guys. Like, how would you feel it if uh, somebody brings something like, and I can name a few, right? So you can ask source is one. And then there is, of yeah. course, reactive technologies as well that are coming now quite trendy. And if you look on the front end, like basic things for me, at least like Redux, people get their mind totally lost on it. And then they just say, oh, this is so complex. Why are we doing this? And then they miss the whole picture. Maybe it's again, us failing to explain. But I had the feeling that they know how to do one way and they don't want to invest anymore in, oh, maybe there is a different way of doing that. So that is maybe the, the tipping point between being the mindless miner hacking away in the trenches, finding mm. gold versus the craftsman who is like, yeah, really into what he's doing and actually knows what he's doing. Yeah, maybe you have a point. But like, do you guys experience the same or will you try to introduce new concepts or even like basic things like TDD and your team is just like, yeah, I don't need this. Well, uh, yeah, I can start, I guess, if uh, you got, because I have an example already, I guess. Uh, because I remember, like, because I'm, I'm an old guy, right? And um, <clears throat> we were moving to uh, actually having some generics into our code, like the Java generic stuff. And, uh, but we totally, we totally went way too much on it. Like some classes, like you extended that class and you had to define like six generics, generic types, right? Just to to extend that class. Yeah. And there, I think it went a little bit overboard where we said like, okay, this is a, a way, a pretty cool way, right? To get, uh, to get the typing a bit, uh, a bit more, uh, you know, consistent, some less casting going on in our co code base by yep. using these generic types. But uh, yeah, the, the rest of the design was uh, a bit too restrictive. And then we ended up with like total unreadable code where we just had like diamonds after diamonds where, you know, how to, you know, the syntax yep. of the generics, right? Like. Yeah, it was just, uh, it was horrible. It was horrible. Yeah. But like, did you get resistance from the team to go to genetics? No, so the team was super enthusiastic, including me, to do it. But the execution of how we did it was just not very good. We just piled on generics as much as we could. And it was just too much. Like, after a couple of weeks, it was just, it became unreadable. Yeah. And you like, you changed one generic and like all the code wouldn't compile anymore. And it was super hard to, to figure out what was going on. 
because we so were did using you guys like, it? No, no, we just went we just went with it, but it just it just made us less productive. Yeah. So do, I don't know. Do you guys have any examples as well? Or no? I see all our thinking. So yeah, I still have to think about. Uh... So, so so while you're thinking, maybe uh, I can. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Unless you have something uh, to share right now. I was just I just I was just thinking about the well the event sourcing part, mm -hmm. and also the customer where we introduced it, and in the end it actually backfired. They went back to well a little bit too crud because I think they didn't get it, and it was well it felt kind of shitty to me anyways because you try to introduce something, you explain mm -hmm. it to people, they seem to get it or they don't, and you go with it, you know, and then go with the whole flow. And in the end, it's like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like putting a lot of effort in something new for them and then losing the whole benefits out of it. <clears throat> well, on I the think other the hand, they actually learned something and then maybe they came to the conclusion this is not for us. Maybe. And that might also be a positive outcome of the whole story. But I think that was not the reason. I just think they were not willing to invest the time to really fully understand the benefits or the downsides of it. And that's a, and that's an interesting question, right? Like we need to invite them and have an open discussion on this. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I think we should do um, that actually. <laughs> so, so how much time should you invest as a team to learn a purely technical, like either architecture or maybe even how much time do you allocate to to migrate to something new? Like, is there is there a a clear cut rule for that? I think probably not, right? I think that is not per se. Like again, I don't know in our case when he talks about uh, XJS migrations and things, but I think a migration should not be like uh, you do that for three months, right? It has to be no. an incremental migration that you do in parallel. Every screen that you touch and you try to make both live on the same time, and eventually mm -hmm. you finish it. Maybe in five years, maybe in ten, maybe never. But I don't think you should stop bringing business value because you need to upgrade technology. I think that's not right. the approach that I would recommend. You would never tell your product owner, like, we need this sprint to just do purely technical refactorings to be able to upgrade a, a, a library. If you do it, you are very brave. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> well, there's always a reason, right? <laughs> I used to tell that. Hey, you can always, there's always a story, right? There's a security risk or whatever. You can always bring something there. No, no, of course. Yeah, and I, I'm not saying that there's no reasons. What I'm saying is that might have a middle ground. Hmm. Yeah. So, and, and would you guys maybe say like, okay, instead of spending all this time learning, uh, I don't know, a new, uh, a new version of your library, like read a book on clean code or learn like no SQL stuff or like, would you... Would you recommend people spending their time in a different way? I would like to just do both. Um. Both? But you have three kids. How are <laughs> you going to do both? <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, um, well, me personally, what, what we have at our own uh, our company, we have like a, once a week you could spend mm -hmm. your time um, you know, doing some, some clever stuff, improving yeah. something. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you know your job. I mean, you, how how packed you are with your uh, with your current stuff. Yeah. But um, time to time, you still have this. Uh, you know, this Wednesdays when you can try out and you pick something and you improve it. Uh, so then you have some time to you know explore or do some uh, some things. Yeah. And of course, I think if you are, uh, in my view, the software engineer, you never stop learning. I would say. And of course, if it's not in a, in a work, yeah. then you know, do it yeah. overnight or... But you have a luxury yeah. position that you have one day a week to try uh, and improve something on your own, basically outside of sprints, right? Well, yes, but you are improving something in the project in yeah. the boundary, let's say, like that. So you are still bringing value or ideas or things yeah. you tried out and so you say, yeah, that works. Do you have to sell those ideas? Like, okay, I want to spend my time, I want to do a proof of concept with... Uh, I don't know, whatever technology uh, you find interesting at that time? Or can you just go ahead and try it out and present your findings? And then maybe if it's interesting, it'll be it'll become part of, you know, the strategy for the team. I think if it's small, then, then you can just go and, 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 of course, in a stand-up, you can just say you want to try out something. Yeah. Uh, uh, there were times when they were, they were 
some people were investigating the new features of Java, for example, and actually yep. presented to the team. Some okay. of them they tried out, you know, something like uh, Cucumber or different uh, frameworks yep. to 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 handle. And yeah, they were pretty nice uh, experience afterwards. Okay. Do you think there came, became a benefit out of it? Because trying, that's that's okay, right, for yourself. But in the end, the company would expect maybe some value out of it. Or not? I think trying that makes you pretty creative. Or, you know, things that you see, you, you never saw before not trying it. So that would make you, I think, a better uh, developer. Yeah. Okay. Me personally, what I, what I see that if I try new things, I see new possibilities. And then yeah. you know, new ideas come to my mind. How, I mean... For me personally, is I see what is actually bothering me, and then yeah, yeah. I start, you know, trying out and working it around, or you know, come up with something uh, much better. And maybe, actually, employee, yeah. and maybe employee satisfaction itself is also uh, a benefit for the company, right? Where you, as a developer, you know, feel like, hey, you know, I get to do what I want here. It's pretty cool, um, and, yeah. and that might be benefit enough for a company as well. And I guess that is also the part of like the business value in the sense of let's say if if you're improving the developer experience, well, you're improving mm -hmm. the end overall, right? And you're gonna better better product. And I think a lot of people also don't look at it, and I think yeah. that's uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. And do you also do stuff like this as a team? Like let's do this all together and see, well, tackle a problem or something else. Um. In the past, we used to do it individually, um, and I think nowadays they have some some uh, ideas that we could do like a, like a team hackathon or something like that. Um, but that's it's not happening that often, I would say. We are doing mostly individually, and of course, if you interested in something, then you just simply pick it up and, and tackle yeah. it. Uh, so perhaps that would be much more benefit. Would be a bigger benefit if we would do it in a team. I would say. Yeah. So, so if I were to be in your team and uh, and I would to say like okay for my time this week I want to try something radically different I want to do uh, today I just want to do a mob programming session with everyone and just work on the sprint is that something uh, you think your team would be interested in, in in doing or is it purely technical and not 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 necessarily like process improvement mm, I think there would be interest if if we would do something uh, you know really interesting in that sense. I mean, if you yeah. do mock programming doing the same uh, you know um, feature implementation, mm -hmm. yeah, perhaps it's not going to be that interesting uh, okay. uh, after all. If you do something like you know everybody's new there, like you know, I don't know, you provision a Kubernetes something here and there, which actually mm -hmm. nobody saw it yet, or I don't know, a Key yeah. Vault, um, I don't know, some big features but you never saw it. That would be nice for everybody. Uh, okay. 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 So, uh, yeah, we're nearly out of time. Well, I guess we can talk for as long as we want, I suppose, but it might be good to uh, start wrapping it up a bit. So I was wondering, uh, I know, I'll start with you. So uh, yeah. does, uh, uh, like, your ex uh, years of experience in development, like, are you still interested in, in, in the newest shiny stuff or did it totally put you off and say, like, yeah, I'm just going to make whatever works and I don't care anymore? In what camp mm. are you? Or is it not that easy? Well, And I'm going to ask this question to each of you guys, right? So uh, you can prepare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you guys can think about it. Yeah. I think the new shiny stuff, I still like it. I still like it a lot. I think it's interesting to learn something new. So, yeah, for example, the, the reactive stuff uh, in the last mm -hmm. project. Enrique brought it with us. And I, thought, I thought it was pretty cool to learn. So, yeah, I like it. But for myself to actually learn it, I have three kids so having the opportunity at the job that helps a lot yeah because yeah, for myself for sure. to invest the actual time i think that's really hard you know i yeah. can read a book about it that's fine but actually doing it like a hobby or well, really invest the time i have problems with that yeah, yeah. just because of yeah. time constraints not because i don't want to yeah all right and Hik, what about you I still like it a lot, man. Uh, I don't do it as a daily job, right, anymore, but uh, I enjoy it a lot to look at it, read at it, understand it, not per se become like a super uh, yeah, expert on the subject, but I like to understand the basis of it. And now because we encounter customers with different languages, it kind of helps me to see how different languages deal with the problem differently. And I, I, I really like it. And... Uh, but mostly I see 
a lot of reinventing the same thing with a different name and then that's pretty mm -hmm. frustrating like why are they doing this this just looks like the other one and kind of the same thing yeah uh, and i had this experience like looking at node.js and then suddenly this guy made dino and i'm like man this is just like java spring just in a different language a different framework like why yeah. why would you go down this path <laughs> so i like it but yeah i don't per se go as deep as i used to go anymore yeah. but uh right. i enjoy it quite a lot cool and Alpa, did you uh, get a chance to uh think of something as well yeah, actually, I'm I'm more in the um, in the craft part. Uh, of course, I like technology and to use it. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays and even the past years, what I was reading of and more like uh, how you would do it better and how, what kind of practices you would not apply. Yeah, uh, language is nice and also you know it's good that you could apply and read and write stuff. Yeah, but it's more for me. It's mostly in that these years when it's important me to how you are writing it and what kind of things you do it afterwards. You know, testing, yeah. um, coupling, and on, on, on things, these things. Yeah, and of course, technology is nice. It will help you. But I think I was reading some articles. Uh, even the the Uncle Bob was saying that actually, if you would uh, bring up some old guys from the past uh, who was writing on those big uh, Fortran machines or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They would be a bit surprised, but they were able to write the code. Uh, so yeah. the other code itself is, didn't change, right? Yeah. It's still a for loop, an if statement, or something yeah. like that. I mean, of course, if you do it via the stream or via a for loop or a while loop or whatever. I don't know. Could they the do it without Stack Overflow? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. So I'm more in the I craft can't. part. I'll say. <laughs> yeah. And you, Rolf? Yeah, so for me, uh, I think... Uh, it's a bit split. Like when I do something for my personal uh, enjoyment, I uh, sometimes actually have the opportunity to do that. And then I actually like to take like the newest stuff or even like uh, like preview versions of things just to see what uh, what is happening and how to use it. Uh, but uh, yeah, when I'm at a customer, I actually prefer to just take whatever is you know tried and true, you know, production hardened. And then I'm also more interested in the way that the development is being done. So, yeah, I don't really care about the technology, but, you know, is it robust? You know, are we doing test-driven development? Uh, are we collaborating? Like, yeah, I like mob programming a yep. lot, but, you know, pair programming at the minimum. And uh, so that, to me, is more important when I'm at a client than, uh, yep. yeah, the newest version of, of whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. But personally, yeah, I like it. Uh, I love it, actually. Yep. That's super cool. All right, so I think that about uh, uh, wraps it up here. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any uh, anything, any closing thoughts for the moment, but uh, no. if not, if not, then uh, I would like to thank, of course, uh, Alpar Gal for for uh, being here on short notice. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks very much. How yeah. did you uh, How did you experience it? It was nice. It was nice talk, actually. Yeah. All right. He was cool. surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was uh, it was a nice nice talk actually to see everybody's uh, you know point of view. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. I want to thank uh, the regulars on the show as well, Henrik and Arno. Always a pleasure yep. having you guys uh, having you guys here. And uh, I want to thank the listener as well. If you guys have any suggestions, then you can of course always email us at podcast at fourscouts dot nl or uh, reach us at fourscouts on Twitter. Uh, send us a message on the uh, anchor.fm page of course and uh, man we're even on YouTube nowadays so uh, you can even comment uh, down below here uh, underneath this video if you're watching uh, for now thanks very much to everyone and see you guys later bye bye see you I know I gotta find this oh, damn, I shouldn't say anything thanks so much for listening to this episode of Scoutcast Roasting Marshmallows with your host Rolf Serg for more great content and to stay up to date, visit 4scouts.nl and on Twitter at 4scouts. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And we'll catch you next time on Scoutcast, Roasting Marshmallows.